What are constructive proofs in mathematics? What are non-constructive proofs? And how does all that relate to intuitionistic logic? Let's find out. Welcome back to The Attic. We're doing a series of videos here on intuitionistic logic and the philosophy that relates to it. One of the central ideas that motivates intuitionistic logic is the idea of constructive proof. Proof should be constructive. Okay, so what does that mean? So I'm going to take you through an example of a non-constructive proof in mathematics, and we're going to have a look whether that makes philosophical sense. And then we'll open up the bigger question. Should meaning be constructive in general? So if you are liking the sound of these topics, come along and join us. Hit that subscribe button. OK, so when I did maths back at school, loads of the homework questions seemed to go like this. Find a number x such that dot 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 or is there a number x such that dot dot dot? And there's kind of two ways to answer that question, right? If someone goes, is there a number such that you can go, yep, it's the number 32. Or you could just go, yep. Uh-huh. Yep. So that first way of doing things, you go, yep, it's the number 32. That's a constructive proof. You are, you are saying there is such a number and it's this one. The second way where you just go, yep, there, there is such a number. That's a non-constructive answer to that question, right? You say there is a number, but you don't say what it is. So that's like the model for a constructive versus a non-constructive proof. A constructive proof will tell you what the number is that you're asking for. The non-constructive proof, it will it'll answer the question. It will say, yep, there is such a number, but it won't tell you which one it is. It won't construct that number. How could a proof do that? How could a proof tell you there is a number, but not tell you which one it is? Let me give you an example. You've got to find two irrational numbers, x and y, such that x to the power of y is a rational number. An irrational number is one that you can't express as a fraction. So the Greeks who liked everything to be rational, they didn't like irrational numbers, but they discovered that root 2 is an irrational number. Okay, what about root 2 to the power of root 2? That is root 2 times root 2 times root 2 root two number of times. Is it rational or is it irrational? It's actually not easy to work out, but it kind of doesn't matter because it's either going to be rational or irrational. If root two to the power of root two is a rational number, then we've basically got our answer because we can take x to be the same as y. We can make them both root two and then root two to the power of root two. Well, we've just said that's a rational number. So that's our answer. If on the other hand, root 2 to the power of root 2 is an irrational number, then we need to do a little bit more work. But it's not that difficult because if root 2 to the power of root 2 is irrational, we could take x to be that number and y to be root 2 because we know that root 2 is an irrational number. And that basically gives us our answer with a little bit of working. So the claim is that then x to the power of y is a rational number because x to the power of y is going to be root 2 to the power root 2 to the power root 2. But that, when you've got a power to a power, that's basically the one power multiplied by the other power. So that's root 2 to the power of root 2 times root 2. OK, but root 2 times root 2 is just 2. So that is equal to root 2 squared, which is just 2 which is obviously a rational number. So there's our answer. The answer is it depends. If root 2 to the power of 2 is a rational number, then we take x and y to be root 2. If root 2 to the power of root 2 is an irrational number, we take x to be root 2 to the power of root 2 and y to be root 2. OK, so I've got this kind of answer that's like, well, if it's one thing, that's my answer. And if it's another thing, that's my answer. That's probably not what you were after if you said, find me a number or find me two numbers X and Y such that. Y you want to know what the answers are. Nevertheless, we've got this proof here, this non-constructive proof that there are irrational numbers X and Y such that X to the power Y is a rational number. So this is kind of where constructive mathematics began. 
looking at proofs like this and saying, we don't want these. OK, but if you don't want it, you've got to say what's wrong with the proof. Which step goes wrong? Not really any of the mathematical steps. What goes wrong, according to constructive mathematicians, is the assumption that this number that we don't know anything about, root 2 to the power of root 2, is either rational or irrational. Because at that point, we didn't have a proof that it was one or the other. I mean, we do now, but back then in the early 20th century, there wasn't a proof one way or the other. There was the assumption that it must be one way or the other, rational or irrational. The constructive mathematician said, well, look, until you can tell me whether it's rational or not, you're not entitled to say it is or it isn't one way or the other. That premise that the number is either rational or irrational is basically an instance of the law of excluded middle, either A or not A. The number is rational or it's not rational, irrational. So what these constructive mathematicians were basically saying is you're not entitled to assert this instance of excluded middle, rational or irrational, of any old number you like until you've actually got a proof one way or another. In trying to block this proof, what they basically said is, ah, you have used classical logic. You have used an instance of excluded middle, and we don't think that's valid. So the way they went about blocking this kind of mathematical reasoning is basically by saying we need to use intuitionistic logic in maths. So in fact, we've already seen other examples of constructive versus non-constructive proof come up when we did natural deduction. Think about the different ways in which we can uh, prove a disjunction in classical natural deduction. Think about, for instance, proving A or not A, the law of excluded middle. We don't do that by, tr by first proving A or first proving not A. Rather, we use indirect proof by assuming excluded middle is false, not A or not A, deriving a contradiction and inferring A or not A. So we have a proof of A or not A, but we don't know which one is the true one. OK, we're saying in classical logic, oh, either A or not A is true, but we're not saying which. That's a non-constructive proof. So for the intuitionist logician, they don't want to do that. So from the point of view of intuitionistic logic, to count as a proof of a disjunction, it's got to be something that either proves A or proves B. So that's really just like the case of constructing a number. But rather than constructing the number that is going to be, there is a number X such that, what we're doing here is we're constructing a proof for one of the disjuncts. And we're saying, I'm proving this disjunction by saying it's that disjunct or it's that disjunct that's the proved one. So what should we make about this debate philosophically? Should we accept non-constructive proofs in mathematics or do the intuitionistic logicians have a good point here? It's complicated in the mathematical case. But let's just suppose we're not talking about the mathematical case. Let's just suppose we're talking about language in general. Is it meaningful to assert existentials without having a particular thing or person or whatever in mind? Is it meaningful to assert disjunctions without having a particular disjunct in mind? I think it's pretty obvious that it is. So there was this one time when I'd parked my car up on the street overnight and when I came out the next day, the wing mirror had been knocked off. And I kind of thought, well, I thought lots of things, but one of the things I thought was like, well, someone's done this, OK? And that seems like something I was entitled to say. It's perfectly meaningful. In fact, I had good justification for saying someone's knocked my wing mirror off because I'm looking at it and it's fallen off and it's not like a kind of random act of God or whatever. But I've got no idea who did it. So I don't have to have a particular person in mind. I don't have to have any particular justification for thinking it's this person or that person. And in fact, I had zero idea who it was. So if I had asserted, oh, it's that person or it's that person, that would have been unjustified. Yet I'm completely justified in thinking that somebody did it. OK, same goes for disjunctions, I reckon. So like, imagine I am this grumpy old school teacher and I turn my back on you to write some stuff on the blackboard and you throw some sweets or whatever and it hits my back and I turn around and I'm looking really cross and I'm going, it was you or it was you or it was you and you're going to be in trouble. Like, that seems something I'm entitled to say. Like, there's only so many people in the class, so either it was you, or it was you, or it was you. 
but I don't know which one it was. So I'm asserting a disjunction, seemingly with good justification, but I'm not really asserting any of the disjuncts. I've got no reason to assert any one of, of those disjuncts. And in fact, you know, if I did want to assert a specific disjunct, like it was you, well, that's not justified. It might not have been you as far as I know. OK, I've got no evidence in favour any of the disjuncts. And yet I've got really good evidence in favour of the whole disjunction. It was one of you. So I think in general, we don't have good philosophical arguments for saying that language has to be constructive. We can use disjunctions without having a particular disjunct in mind. We can use existentials without having a particular thing or person, a particular witness in mind. Whether that carries over to the mathematical case, well, really, that's a matter of what do we think about the existence of mathematical entities? What do we think about the existence of numbers? Are numbers something that are out there independently of our thinking activities? Or are they something that kind of exists because we think about them? Do they exist because we construct them in our counting activities? If it's the first case, so like Platonism about mathematics, then I guess it makes perfectly good sense to say, there is a number, even though we don't know what it is. In the constructive case, the anti-realist case, where we're saying that numbers kind of depend on our thinking activity, then, mm, yeah, maybe it doesn't make sense to say that there is this number, even though we don't know what it is. OK, so there you have the debate over constructive versus non-constructive proofs in mathematics, in philosophy. What's the answer? Uh, I don't really know. If you've got a good answer, why don't you leave it down in the comments below? If you've got any questions, why not ask in the comments? If you're liking this stuff, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon to get updates. I hope you join me back for more videos about intuitionistic logic. OK, I will see you next time.